Hey everybody, welcome to Just the News. I am Carrie Sheffield and excited for our guest today. It is David Harris Jr. He is a member of the advisory board for President Trump's Black Voices for Trump for his 2020 campaign. He is also the author of the book, Why I Couldn't Stay Silent. Welcome, David. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. So, David, let's get right into 2020, the campaign. Obviously, race is a very hot button issue right now. Um, I want to start with the breaking news about this interview that Kanye West gave to Forbes. He's spoken out and saying he is now taking off the red MAGA hat. He had been pictured, you know, sporting the Make America Great hat, visiting the Oval Office with President Trump. What's your read on Kanye's disendorsement and how this might affect the perception within the black community? Well, I think it's pretty interesting. Kanye is a very, very interesting individual. I, I cannot deny that he seems to have had an amazing awakening, uh, spiritual awakening. Uh, his CD was, is, is filled with uh, God's presence. I feel it in there. Um, and I know that his original, you know, coming out in support of the president and coming out basically in support of all black people not having to vote one political party, which has been Democrats for 60 years, uh, I think all that has spoken volumes. I'm not sure what is actually going through his mind right now. I've seen some different perspectives on what he could be thinking and what he could be trying to do. Uh, he may just be trying to distance himself from Donald Trump enough to be able to get some of the black community that would not vote for Trump, but may have voted for Biden to write his name in. Uh, I think at this time it's too late for him to actually get on the ballot, but people can write names in. So if, if, that, is, if that is his tactic, I don't really think he's serious about really trying to win the presidency right now. Uh, I think that, if anything, it's more strategic in maybe trying to get some black votes that would have voted, voted for Biden to actually vote for Kanye. So, you know, with Kanye, it's, it's anybody's guess from day to day where he's going to go, what he's going to do, what he's going to say. Uh, I think he believes he knows what he's doing inside of his own mind. But I think that we, the people, have to just kind of sit back and watch. So I think if the strategy is to try to take some of the votes from Biden, uh, I think that that would win. That would that would do something. Um, everything helps in this race. We're we're at a pretty historic point in our history, and we definitely need uh, President Donald Trump reelected. We need four more years of him and his administration. So I think we're time's going to have to tell what exactly is going through Kanye's mind. That's that's really interesting uh, theory that he might be trying to siphon Democratic voters who might be voting for just, you know, black Americans who might be voting for Biden to write in his birthday party. Um, and that's very interesting because he has also in the same interview, he said that he thinks that the uh, so-called juggernaut or this perception that if you're a black, you must be Democrat, uh, he still wants to break that. So it seems like in some respects, he's wanting black voters to be independent. Do you think that's kind of what he's going for? Well, I think that he's been championing that message of, of black since he's come out politically. Uh, it's something that needs to be done. It's something that all black Americans uh, must understand. And, and it's it's more cultural, I think, than anything. It's definitely cultural. It's ingrained in, uh, in the black community. I have so many of my black, on the black side of my family, I'm, I'm mixed. My mom's white of Irish descent. My dad is black. The, the black side of my family has pretty much written me off. Uh, they've actually made fun of me. They've actually shared things that were pretty derogatory on social media. And it's interesting because they know me. They, they are my family. I grew up with them. I spent time at their house with their with them, with their families, with their my cousins, their, their kids. And uh, speaking speaking spe specifically to some aunts and uncles that I've had to deal with, mostly the aunts. But I, I believe that it's something that definitely must be uh, must be done for the black community to wake up and realize we all have a voice and we all have a vote and our vote counts. And our vote should line up with our values, and we shouldn't pledge any blind allegiance to any particular party. Uh, and I'm not telling anybody who to vote for. I'm just saying do your own research. That's what my mom actually raised me to do. And I, I personally was excited about the opportunity to vote for the first black man for president. Uh, I talk about that in my book, Why I Couldn't Stay Silent. Um, I was excited. And then my mom, she said, just research how he's voted on the issues that matter to you. And I think that if most in the black community would actually research the platform that is the Democrat Party, uh, what they stand for, what, what they uh, emulate, we'd realize that they're, they're not really for anything that's, that has the rich heritage that the black community is, is known for. Uh, we, we don't want handouts. We, they've done nothing for us. The welfare state has decimated the black community. It's what increased a single parent, um, a single parents raising kids from 20 percent to over 70 percent uh, since the, uh, the the Great Society's inception. And we're also very pro-faith and pro-family. 
And uh, the Democrat Party is none of those things. So I think that if the black community would actually do some more research instead of just listening to what maybe they've been ingrained and told since they were kids, they'd find out that their values actually line up differently than the Democrat Party. So for that, I, I do hope that uh, and believe that Kanye is trying to get people to wake up, speak, speak and think independently uh, and not just pledge a blind allegiance to to a party, especially one that doesn't represent you. Well, and certainly Kanye has spoken out about Planned Parenthood and abortion and has said that it was purposely designed to exterminate the black race. Uh, and we know that if you're a Democrat who's trying to run and you're pro-life uh, within the Democratic Party, there is just crickets of support and you might even get primaried uh, and removed, which is what happened to a Democrat in Illinois. But David, I want to ask you, um, because you mentioned the Great Society program, I, we just had Diamond and Silk here on the program last week, and we talked about this issue of the question of white liberal supremacy. And you mentioned the breakdown of the black family and how the black family was so much more cohesive before the great society. What do you think is the, uh, the calculus that white liberals are making? Uh, because when you look at the results of these welfare programs, they destroyed the black family. This is what a lot of people argue when you look at the data themselves. Um, so if you were a white supremacist, wouldn't that actually be your goal to have the black family destroyed? And so in, in some respects, what Diamond and Silk were saying was that what we have today is white liberal supremacy, uh, and yet it is conservatives who are being attacked as such. I mean, what's your read on this, Steve, this concept of white liberal supremacy? Yeah, well, I love Diamond and Silk. So they're good friends of mine. They, they nail it on the head. I think that what they said is absolutely accurate. I think that uh, if there is any systemic racism that's taken place in our country, that has been it. It's been the, the systemic breakdown uh, and racist attack directly against the black community from the Great Society Act, from the welfare state, from attacking and literally going door to door in the 60s to black neighborhoods and black homes and letting the mothers know that if there was no husband, no father in the house, then the government would basically be their daddy. And uh, that's what's led to the, the, all of the horrible statistics that we've seen from, uh, from father absence in the home. So that is systemic racism. There is, uh, you know, the, the, the white liberals are supposed to be or they're, they think they're championing the black communities. But I think on the on the other side, they think they're better than us. They think that they're bolden and it's individuals, it's black leaders, so-called leaders uh, in the black community, in black hip hop, in black entertainment, black actors, uh, ball players that uh, that call us black conservatives out that emboldens these white liberals to say, yes, yeah, see, you're on my side. But they're really the they're really the slave keepers, the slave masters, the plantation owners. Uh, and they want all and as many black 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 people to stay on their uh, mental plantation as possible. So, David, you mentioned black entertainers, and I know you recently had a scuffle uh, with the rapper Snoop Dogg. Talk a little bit about that and what's been the fallout for you since. Yeah. So basically Snoop Dogg, so many people have seen it. I've had messages. Uh, where Snoop Dogg had posted a picture of several of us, Diamond and Silk, Candace Owens, the Hodge twins, Terrence Williams, all of these are people, good friends of mine, Pastor Daryl Scott, uh, Paris Bernard, and myself, and basically called us the Coon Bunch. So what people need to understand, and that's a very racist and derogatory term for one black person to call another black person, it's pretty much the equivalent of a white person calling a black person the N-word. So it's very racist, and I think that uh, you know Snoop Dogg doing that it shows where his allegiance lies. I think that he gave himself a proper name, calling himself a dog, and the dogs are very extra. They're very loyal. You know, we have two dogs in our home. My wife and I do, but I really say they're more my wife's dogs than mine because they follow her around everywhere. They want to be by her all the time. They're completely loyal to a fault, and I believe that Snoop Dogg has shown where his loyalty lies, and it's to the Democrat Party. Uh, it's not to people. It's to an ideology, and that ideology is everything that is wrong with this country. So for Snoop Dogg to actually put me on his hit list uh, means that uh, he believes that I'm a threat. Uh, and, and, and what's threatening about me is that I challenge people to think for themselves, to vote for, the, vote for their values, to do their own research, to not be politically bl blind, to not go with the status quo, to actually make up your own mind and make up your own decision and come to your own decision. And apparently that's threatening to individuals like Snoop Dogg and so many other black celebrities uh, that have done the exact same thing and called us get called us names, called us racist slurs, uh, the same way that the white people do, the, the white liberals do. They call us names, they call us racial, racial slurs. So it's pretty interesting that they're all on the same side of the aisle uh, and that we're the ones that are the, that are the threat. So David, I wanna talk about the generational shift that seems to be happening among 
black voters. So UCLA, which is certainly no right-wing institution, uh, UCLA recently came out with a study that we wrote about here at Just the News, and it found that young black voters, particularly those 18 to 44, were much more open to President Trump, much more likely to say some sort of favorable feeling toward the president as opposed to older generations. Now, it was still a very substantial gap in terms of favorability for Democrats, but we're talking about maybe four to five, six single digits for the older voters, but maybe 10, 15, 20, 25 percent favorability among these younger people, these younger black Americans. What do you think is driving this differential for younger black Americans? Because the perception, if you look at social media or the mainstream media, is that young black Americans, they all think one way. What do you think is driving the specific generational divide within black America? Well, I think that, you know, it's hard to teach an old dog new tricks. That saying is true because it's because that's what it is. You know, when somebody's had something ingrained in their heart and their mind for so long, decades upon decades, and they're in their 50s, 60s, 70s, it's a lot harder for them to wake up to the truth because uh, it's easier to just believe what they've been believing is accurate, is true, and not change. I think that what we've seen in, in recent years, especially under this administration, I think specifically under this current administration, is that because this president didn't need the black vote to win, um, yet he continues to do things for black communities around this country. Uh, you look at pr historic prison reform. Obama had eight years to do anything with prison reform, and he didn't get it done. You look at historical record funding for uh, for historical black colleges and universities, literally record funding for these HBCUs. Obama didn't do that. Uh, Obama didn't make it part of the uh, part of the budget so that they were actually per getting permanent funding. Um, this president did do that. When you look at historic unemployment for the black community, as well as the Hispanic community, Asian community, and 70 plus year low for women, but specifically when we're talking about black voters, when you look at young un unemployment in the black community, again, it was the three and a half years that, uh, that this current administration and President Donald Trump, uh, it's, it was his policies that gave us that. And so while the mainstream media won't give him any credit, you know who does give him credit? All the individuals and so many more, hundreds, even thousands more individuals like what Snoop Dogg put on that post targeting us. We're the ones that are out here championing the message and sharing the truth of what this president's doing. We're bypassing the mainstream media because most of the younger generation, they're not getting their news from the mainstream media. They're getting it from social media. So we are the true warriors here that are sharing the message of this president that's waking people up and it's waking up young, young voters uh, in huge percentages. So I think that's why there's such a big gap. The older generation, they're not on social media as much. They're not as quick to change their tune. Um, but uh, the younger generation is, is as politically heightened and uh, uh, aware as people are right now, I think like before, I, I don't know if there's ever been a generation where so many young people are actively involved in politics and political matters, uh, and we have social media to be able to share the news. So it's a beautiful thing. When I see, uh, when I see young black men, women, young girls uh, that are posting truths that uh, they know about this president and trying to expose the Democrat odds that they are, it just makes me smile thinking and believing that I had some little part to play in a lot of those people waking up. So, and David, talk us through, how did you get through this political conversion? Because you mentioned you were excited to vote for the first black president, uh, and now you've got your book coming out, or yes. your book is already out, why I couldn't stay silent. Just really briefly, give us a snapshot of how that process happened for you, that you went from, just like Diamond and Silk, they had been lifelong Democrats, and, and now they're uh, obviously big, strong supporters of the president. Yeah, well, I can't say I was a lifelong Democrat because I wasn't very political. Um, I didn't vote. I, I didn't, wasn't raised in a very political household. Um, but uh, what I did do was did my research. And, and so when, when Barack Obama was you know, running for president, I was excited. I think as every black person was in this country for the opportunity to elect uh, a black individual as president of the United States. And then my mom said, do your research. And when I discovered that he had voted against a bill that would have provided medical treatment for babies that survived abortion. And when I also discovered that he voted in favor of partial birth abortion, uh, that everything else went out the window. I didn't care what color he was. He was not going to get my vote. And then to see so many people that did vote for him when I believe that if that's often somebody's moral compass, if they believe that dismembering a baby in the womb when that baby's been growing for six, seven, eight, nine months, when they think that's okay, uh, what else is wrong with their paradigm? What else is wrong with their moral compass? I believe there's a lot wrong with that. So that's when I really began to, to get engaged politically and try to wake people up and say, does this really represent you? Do you really want somebody that doesn't want babies that survived an abortion to, to not get medical treatment once they actually survive? 
and and so I was uh, I was rallying against Obama actually during that time. And then when Donald Trump came on the scene again, I started to do my research and I listened to what the man said. And then I saw how the mainstream media, the liberal mainstream media, continue to try to paint this president in negative lights, taking sound bites uh, from things that he had said from from whole speeches to paint to paint him as a racist. And I said, wow, there's an attack on this guy. Uh, and I believe that he supports my current values, my Christian Judeo values. Uh, I believe that he supports what I value in life and I'm going to support him. Uh, and that's when uh, when I couldn't stay silent anymore was a after the third debate between Donald Trump and Hillary. Uh, there were so many things that Hillary was dodging and so many truths that the president that Donald Trump at that point uh, had shared. And the biggest one being his championing his desire to champion the lives of unborn babies and Hillary Clinton literally saying that she didn't des believe that unborn babies deserved any rights whatsoever. So I hopped on social media. I had like 2000 friends. And I just ranted for about 14 minutes uh, as a Christian, as a husband, as a father, as a business owner. This is what I feel is at stake for our country. And the video went viral. And the messages I received from men, women, black, Hispanic, Asian, white, that said that uh, they, uh, the theme of the messages were that they were Democrats or whole family were Democrats. But because of my message and my video, they were going to vote for Trump because that was a vote for life. So I, I felt from that that I needed to just continue to share my voice, and that's what I've continued to do. And then I felt uh, last year that I was supposed to actually pin my words and talk about why I couldn't stay silent and why I feel that it's important for others to not stay, stay silent and, and share what I believed I was seeing taking place in the mainstream media, what I believe the, the new KKK of today is. Uh, I make those connections, what I believe the new civil rights movement is and where I believe that we're going and why we should support this president. And I put all that in my book, uh, which you can get it. Uh, you can get it on my website at davidharrisjr.com. Uh, you can get my book there. Um, so it, it's been an amazing thing to hear the responses from people that have read it, from independents, even Democrats, that say that it's woken them up to truths that they didn't know or didn't see because the mainstream media didn't cover it. And um, it's an honor to be in this fight championing this president and his administration. So, David, one of the things you mentioned was that uh, you were opposing Barack Obama regardless of what color he was. I see often uh, people who are conservative, often if they're white, uh, if they say they opposed Barack Obama for X, Y, Z reason, they're then immediately labeled as yeah. a racist because they opposed the first black president. Um, what do you think has happened to our culture where the dream of Dr. Martin Luther King where someone would be judged based on the content of their character or perhaps even the content of their argument uh, as opposed to attacking them personally. Well, I think that it's, it's, been, a, it's been a slow, gradual, and now we're seeing that the, the, the tipping point of a breakdown in our educational system. I, I think the, the fact that so many in, of our teachers, uh, university professors, um, are liberal. I believe it's 80 to 90 percent in most colleges and universities around the country. They're teaching things. They're teaching more uh, divisiveness. They're teaching more race baiting rhetoric. They're teaching that capitalism is evil. Uh, and they're not talking about and teaching and, and training our, our younger generations on character. Uh, and then you add to it the mainstream media and the mainstream media is bent. They're, they're literally the liberal arm, the, the, the media arm of the Democrat Party. And everything is about race. And everything is about breaking people apart and, and division. And uh, you know, divided we will we will fall if we're divided. And I believe that there is a very evil agenda at work to try to break down this country's system uh, and and take us over. And I think that there's a global. I, I know that there's a global uh, there's a, a global agenda in the works. And America can't be the free country that we are for that global agenda to work. So there's a dynamic of things that are all spewing over right now, and the one person and his administration that's standing in the way of globalism taking over and socialism truly becoming the land of the, the law of the land is Donald Trump and his presidency. All right, David Harris Jr., thank you so much for joining us. Tell us real quick, where can we find your podcast? David J., you gotta have that J in there, the David J. Harris Jr. show on your favorite podcast platform, and then you can get my book at uh, davidharrisjr.com. All right, David, thanks so much for joining us here. Thank on you so Studios. much for having me.